Hello and welcome back. So today I want to talk to you about dynamic mode decompositions, operators, and in particular the Hilbert spaces that these operators operate over. The selection of Hilbert space can have dramatic effects on the sorts of dynamics that you can examine with operators over that space. And so today I'm going to introduce you to two different Hilbert space ideas that allow us to have access to non-local dynamical systems. Dynamic mode decomposition is a data-driven approach to analyzing dynamic data. And it had its start studying fluid dynamical systems where we have nice benchmarks like vortex shedding and flow across the cylinder. Now the idea behind dynamic mode decompositions, you're casting the state of a nonlinear dynamical system into an infinite dimensional feature space. And you are effectively turning the study of this nonlinear dynamical system into the study of a linear operator where you can analyze its spectrum, obtain eigenfunctions and eigenvalues, and hopefully you can use these eigenfunctions and eigenvalues in order to decompose the original state vector through the full state observable. However, how effective this is or what kind of dynamics you can examine changes depending on the Hilbert space. So why don't we go back to the start and talk about where dynamic mode decomposition began. So initially, dynamic mode decomposition was done with just matrices. You would have a matrix of your inputs and a matrix of your outputs, and then you would work on doing some sort of matrix inversion in order to give you an approximation of a nonlinear dynamical system based on these snapshots that you've taken. Now that works really well in practice for high dimensional systems, systems that are related to say, fluid dynamics. But once you saturate your dimensionality with the number of snapshots, then all you really have is a, an approximation of a linear system. And if the number of snapshots exceeds the dimensionality of the space, then since the system that you're approximating with is ultimately linear, you will ultimately end up having some issues. So researchers realized this very early on and they introduced what is called extended dynamic mode decomposition. And this basically augments the state variable by throwing it into, say, a high dimensional feature space. But this still runs into the same problem of saturation of the dimension. And so you want it to even better. The next step was to map it to an infinite dimensional feature space. And this is what led to kernel DMD. And in that perspective, we are looking at the Koopman operator. The Koopman operator is a composition operator that will allow you to model discrete time dynamical systems or an approximation of continuous time dynamical systems where that system was discretizable. But not every system is discretizable and we would like to be able to access the continuous time dynamics directly without a discretization. And this is what has led me and my co-authors to introduce the occupation kernels and level operators in order to approach this dynamic mode decomposition problem. So occupation kernels got their start as a generalization of occupation measures. Occupation measures are a tool in optimal control theory and occupation kernels and occupation measures both represent the same functional on their respective spaces. So this functional corresponds to a trajectory from a dynamical system or perhaps a continuous signal. And it composes that continuous signal into an observable from the space, and then it integrates from zero to some fixed time t. It turns out that with the right conditions on your trajectory and on the observables, that this ends up being a bounded linear functional on the space. And in the case of reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, you end up getting a function that represents this functional through the inner product space, and we call that the occupation kernel. Occupation kernels and Liouville operators are very closely connected in that if you take a Liouville operator, which acts on an observable by taking its gradient and then multiplying by the dynamics of a system, that if you have a trajectory that corresponds to that dynamical system that your occupation kernel represents, then the adjoint of that Liouville operator on the occupation kernel results in a difference of two kernels centered at the two endpoints of the trajectory. And we can use this relationship to gain access to a sample of an unknown nonlinear dynamical system, and we can use that to make finite rank operators and do dynamic mode decompositions. And this is all with trajectories as our central unit of data. The 
And so what my colleague Rushi and I did was we introduced occupation kernels and level operators to study continuous time systems directly and avoiding the discretization of the dynamics that is necessary with the Koopman operator. And so what that allows us to do is it allows us to access a lot of dynamics that don't emit a discretization. Things like x dot is equal to 1 plus x squared, which is just a quadratic system that has finite escape time. And by accessing the Leoville operator directly rather than through Kuban operators and very small time steps, we can actually broaden the scope of DMD to a wide variety of systems where the Kuban operator really didn't apply. However, this is still very limited as far as the scope of the systems that you can examine. And one of the reasons for this is that all the Hilbert spaces that the Leoville operator or the Kuban operator are all posed over are based on the state space. And so this means that non-local dynamics, or rather the dynamics that don't depend on the state you're at right now, don't really fit well with these operators. And so the objective for the AFOSR YIP has been towards finding non-local generalizations of these Hilbert spaces. And once we have these Hilbert spaces, we can introduce operators to do dynamic mode decomposition for something like fractional order systems, or more surprisingly, second order dynamical systems, which have a non-local formulation. Wait, wait, wait. How could there be two Spider-Man? There can't be two Spider-Man. Can there? So now what we're going to get into are two different Hilbert space definitions. And these are going to allow us to talk about non-local operators over them. And it may be surprising, but second order dynamical systems can manifest as a non-local operator. And we can see this if we start with taking a look at the Leoval operator. So how do we get the Leoval operator? And that really just comes down to taking a trajectory of your dynamical system and putting it into a function from your function space. And so if we do that and we take the time derivative, you're going to see that the time derivative of this function composed with the trajectory from the system ends up giving you the gradient of that function composed with the trajectory of the system times the derivative of that trajectory itself. But if we know that the trajectory, say, came from the dynamical system itself, then that would basically just mean it is f of that trajectory. And then we go ahead and cover up the trajectory here, and then you get your label operator, a gradient of g times f. So we'd like to do the same sort of thing, but with second order systems. So that if we take, say, a function and a trajectory that satisfies this sort of particular second order dynamical systems, so the second derivative of gamma is equal to f of gamma, then we hope that if we were to take this and put it into a function or observable, and we go ahead and we take its derivative twice, that we're going to end up with an operator that we can work with at the end of the day. So then if you go ahead and you try to perform this sort of operation, what you're going to find is that you get the second time derivative of g, our function, composed with the trajectory. And this is expressed as the first time derivative of our trajectory transposed times the Hessian of our function evaluated at our trajectory, and then times the time derivative of our trajectory again. And then we're going to add the gradient of g composed with our trajectory times the second derivative or the second time derivative of our trajectory. And so then if we go ahead and try to put this back in terms of our original dynamics, the second derivative of our trajectory just becomes f of the trajectory, just by definition. But if you take a look at all these points where we have a single time derivative, we need to replace those with an integral of our trajectory. So let's say the first derivative of our trajectory at t ends up becoming the derivative of our trajectory at time zero, plus the integral from say zero to the current time of our dynamics composed with the trajectory and that integrated dt. That integral ends up giving us a sort of non-local representation, and so we can't just cover up the trajectory and just replace x in here, because now we need to know the history of the trajectory as well. And the same sort of thing manifests when you talk about fractional order systems. And so then what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and introduce you to a reproducing kernel Hilbert space uh, that is going to allow us to describe this as an operator over this Hilbert space. And so what we're going to need is we're going to need vector valued reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. And once we have that, we are going to find something called a signal valued reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So why don't we go back to my home office and we can talk more there. So let's talk about these Hilbert spaces. So in order to facilitate that operator, that non-local operator, we actually need to develop a Hilbert space that takes signals to signals rather than states to states. We have devised two different strategies for this, and ultimately they are computationally equivalent. 
Now they both have their own technical details. I have the signal value to reproduce kernel hover space, but we also have occupation kernel hover spaces. And the first one relies on the theory of vector valued reproduced kernel Hilbert spaces. And if you saw the talk given by my colleague Rishikesh Kamal Porkar, then you likely have some idea of what goes on there. On the other case, we have occupation kernel Hilbert spaces. And these don't necessarily rely on reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. And in fact, their definition is independent of a reproduced kernel Hilbert space. But at the same time, we derive examples of both of these Hilbert spaces from a reproduced kernel Hilbert space. So a reproducing kernel Hilbert space is a Hilbert space of functions mapping a state x to the reals or the complex numbers. What's significant about this space and what differentiates it from other Hilbert function spaces is that function evaluation is bounded on this space. So there is a kernel function that reproduces function evaluation through the inner product of that space. Now, what we're doing here is we're not just talking about states now. We are talking about a collection of signals, uh, continuous signals. And we want to map continuous signals or maybe n times continuously differentiable signals to m times continuously differentiable signals. And in order to do this, we are going to be looking at some sort of function that we're going to be calling, say, phi. And we're going to be mapping these signals, say, generally, we're going to be calling them, say, theta. So the objective is to come up with a Hilbert space of these phi's that are going to operate on your thetas and give you phi of theta of t. And this t will run from, say, zero to some fixed time, capital T. Now, it turns out that in both cases, we use more or less the same canonical mapping. And so you start with a reproducing kernel Hilbert space consisting of, say, continuously differentiable functions, or even real analytic functions, so functions that are infinitely differentiable. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the composition of this function, say, g, from our reproducing kernel Hilbert space with the signal theta. And so when you compose theta into g, then what you're going to end up getting is another signal that is just written as g composed with theta. And this is a signal from over zero to t. This same construction is used for both the single value reproduced kernel Hilbert spaces and the occupation kernel Hilbert spaces, where for the former is explicitly how we construct the space, and for the latter, we actually use this as an example of a kind of space. What this ultimately gives us is a mapping to these phi's. And so we generally write phi sub g to indicate that this is obtained from a function in another space. And keep in mind, if we want this to be vector valued, we would just stack these g's in a vector. So that gives you more or less the structure of what these spaces look like. But in each case, we have a different inner product. And that makes them different Hilbert spaces. But I don't want to go into the details of those in particular, uh, just because that will be a little bit too far afield of our objectives here. Now, when most people think about non-local systems and non-local operators, they're not thinking about second order dynamical systems. What they're thinking of are usually fractional order dynamical systems. And there are two different fractional order derivatives that give rise to two different kinds of dynamical systems. And both of these involve the two operators, the riemann liouville fractional integral and ordinary differentiation. Now we define the riemann liouville derivative by first taking a fractional integral and then taking a full derivative. So if you want the one-half derivative uh, in the riemann liouville sense, then you take a one-half integral and then you take a full derivative. And if you want a fractional derivative in the Caputo sense, you do the opposite. You take a full derivative and then you take a half integral. Now what's interesting here is that this means that there are some functions that might not be differentiable, that might be riemann liouville fractional differentiable, but that isn't the case for the Caputo derivative because you need to take the full derivative first. But the advantage of using the Caputo approach is that when you make an initial value problem out of it, it turns out that all you need are integer order initial conditions. So they are physically realizable. Whereas in the riemann liouville case, you have to deal with fractional initial values, and those are harder to quantify in terms of some sort of physical system. So engineers often appeal to fractional differentiation with the Caputo sense, and that's what we're gonna do here. So something to note is that if you have a fractional order differential equation in the Caputo sense, then you have the Caputo derivative applied to your state x of t is equal to f of x of t. And if you want to be able to get x back, you take a riemann liouville integral on both sides. And so what you ultimately see then is that x of t is equal to the riemann liouville integral of f of x of t, 
And something that's really interesting, and we're going to use this in a moment, is that if you take the derivative of both sides, on the left-hand side, you'll get differentiation of your state vector, which we know is possible since this is a dynamical system in the Caputo sense. And on the right-hand side, you get the Riemann-Liouville derivative of your dynamics composed with the state vector. So now what we can do is we can define the fractional order Liouville operator or at least one of two that I work with, and this is a little bit easier to talk about. The fractional order label operator is defined like this. So what you do is you take your scalar valued functions, and we're gonna think of all of these functions as being represented by some function inside of a reproduced kernel Hilbert space in that canonical way that I mentioned earlier. So if I take one of these functions and I take its gradient, I really mean that I'm talking about the gradient with respect to the underlying function. So what we do is we take these single valued functions and we compose with the trajectory coming from our dynamical system. Now, if you take the full derivative of this, then you're going to end up getting the gradient of that single valued function times the derivative of your trajectory. And we know that derivative of the trajectory can be written as a fractional integral of f of that trajectory. And now we want this to work for more than just that particular trajectory. So we're going to replace that trajectory in this new formal equation with a signal, a continuous signal. And so now we have a definition for our fractional order label operator. And in particular, it sends the signal valued function phi to the gradient of phi times f. And so then this is ends up being another signal valued function. Now we've kind of hidden where the whole non-localness comes in, and this is hidden inside of that riemann liouville derivative. There is an integral in there, which means that we actually are depending on the history of our signal all the way back to time zero. And so we definitely need this whole signal valued notion in order to define this operator. Now it turns out that this fractional label operator works with our occupation kernels just in the way like a regular label operator work. And so if we take the adjoint of this fractional order label operator on the signal valued equivalent of these occupation kernels, then you end up getting a difference of say two kernel functions, where these kernel functions are also signal valued in some sense. And so this gives us an ability to extract a sample of this fractional order label operator. And this is one of two versions of a fractional order label operator. And this one will give you that nice eigenfunction relation where you get exponentials. And another will give you an eigenfunction relation that corresponds to the mittag leffler function. But uh, that might be a discussion for another time. So I just want to thank you for all for listening and for tuning in here. And I'll see you next time.